Welcome back to Alive at Five. I'm your host, David Leonard, and it's my pleasure to be joined on the phone here this afternoon by Sandra Champlain. She is the author of a book entitled We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. We're going to spend some time today talking about that and, and some other related issues as we go forward here. Sandra, good afternoon. Welcome aboard. Hi, David. Thanks for having me on today. Thanks for making some time to visit with us. Here at the beginning, for a, a listener out there who may never have heard of you, if you'd be so kind, please tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Sandra Champlain? Oh, Sandra Champlain is a girl living in Massachusetts. My day job is I'm a chef for race car teams. I also own a small coffee and chocolate store in Connecticut. I'm the absentee owner. And just as of January 2013, I am the author of a book called we Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. That hit number one on Amazon, I'm proud to say, in April. And I am spending my time, uh, when I can, really helping people live great lives and believe in life after death. Well, what made you start researching the subject of the possibility of life after death? David, it was back around 1996 that I just developed a huge fear of dying and I can't pinpoint exactly what happened but there are times you know I'm thinking I'd lost pets that had died my grandfather had passed my dad had been diagnosed with cancer I think at the time my life was going kind of crummy have you ever had the experience that the same stuff keeps happening over and over and over and um, you know looking up at the stars sometimes too the question comes up who am I what is my life for? Is there a reason to all of this? And that showed itself as just a fear of the unknown about life after death. And that you know, I just couldn't rest at night unless I had an answer beyond my religion. And I grew up Catholic, so faith, we heard about a lot. But that wasn't enough for me. Well, I think it's probably pretty common for, for us human beings to wonder and to, to consider what happens to us when we physically die here simply because we know it's going to happen. It's inevitable. We're all mortal. We're, we're born. We live for a period of time, and then we pass on. But as you say, you know, this was, this was really a, sounded like something that really began to consume you. I'm curious, when you, when you talk about researching the subject of life after death, how did you go about that? Uh, the first thing, I didn't know um, where this adventure would take me. Well, this discovery, I started with major world religions, and I looked to see if anybody had the goods, you know, anybody really knew, and again, more messages of faith, and randomly, a girlfriend of mine brought me to see a stage show, to see a uh, medium perform, and I went just to be with my friend, and it would be fun, and something different, of course, the skeptic in me knew that it was purely entertainment, that this you know, these people give generalities. And David, when I saw this medium perform, she was so specific, telling people the names, how people had passed away, details, I mean, really specific. And so my mind first went to, oh, these people must be plants in the audience, and there must be a reason, there must be some hard sell coming at the end. And none of that happened. So it kind of landed on me that I needed to know more who this medium was, how could she do that, and lo and behold, I found she offered a weekend course in California, and if you attended, this was the promise. You would be somebody effectively able to tell the deceased people around others. So you know what I was thinking. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> I don't believe in that. But the skeptical... Um, Skeptical girl inside said, it's not possible. Person inside me that said, you know, I am afraid of dying, and I did see her accurately tell people names, what if? And that had me book a ticket to Laguna Beach, California, back in 2005. And so where did your story go from there? Where it went from there is I showed up in a group of people that I felt I didn't belong. I was wearing my khaki pants and my polo shirt and there was about 20 people in what I would say a little bit of gypsy wear, you know, the long dresses and um, they looked like the psychic and the medium crowd and I didn't think I fit in. But Doreen Virtue was the name of this medium giving the course and 
in the beginning, she said, I want to tell you how we do medium readings. We're not going to do it yet, but this is just how. So we're going to just do a demonstration. We're not really doing it. You're just going to use your imagination and play medium. So she had us each take a partner and sit face to face, close our eyes, hold our hands. We were sitting knee to knee. And she says, now, what we do when we give a medium reading is she says, imagine there's this invisible energy between your heart and it's a safe space, and I just want you to invent, like you were a medium, a person standing behind your partner, just use your imagination, give them a name, uh, maybe what they did for a living, maybe how they died, and any messages that come through. And as I am a chef, I think I am more creative than some others, um, it was easy for me to do this. So in my make-believe mind, I created a man standing behind my partner. I gave him the name Jan. I said, it's your grandfather on your mom's side. And then I saw, I said, he's got a big gap between his two front teeth. He has windburn skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, died of lung cancer. And here's a message he wants you to give your mother. And so I opened my eyes, like, okay, it's your turn to play medium, and her She's just got some tears um, running down her cheeks. David, her grandfather on her mom's side was named Jan. He was a fisherman in Denmark. He died of lung cancer. He had that big gap between his two front teeth. And the words that I spoke, the message was something that this man had never told his daughter while he was alive. And so the skeptic in me started, I mean, it opened my mind to, I mean, it was just one of those wow moments. Um, that, first of all, if mediumship is real, certainly it wouldn't be anything that was given to me. Who am I? But it, that just opened the door, and my skepticism started to fade away. Um, but then I started looking for more proof. That wasn't enough because over the course of the three days, I was accurate many times, but I was off even more times. And so to see the deceased and, and to get these psychic hits, if you will, it appears just like the imagination. So needless to say, I was not ready yet to come out <laughs> that I had done this. I needed more information. Now, Sandra, you've been describing yourself at this point in your life as a skeptic. I want you just to, to define that, that word for us in, in the way that you're using it. Um, sure. A skeptic to me, and I think it even goes back to some of the Greek roots of the word um, for skepticism is not knowing for sure one way or the other. Um, I, I don't have the dictionary in front of me to give you the actual, but in the way I relate it to myself in my experience is if I can't prove it to be real, it's not real, um, my skepticism, I think, was formed and I think most of us, because um, it's like it's natural to be skeptic. We, I don't know if you've realized it and your listeners, but if we stop talking for just a minute, there's a little voice that continues to talk in our head. And I stop just for a minute, and for most people they say, well, what little voice in my head? And that's the little voice. As human beings, we all have this inner critic who is saying things are right, things are wrong, I should do this, I shouldn't do this. We look in the mirror, some of us ladies, we're too big, we're not pretty enough, um, I'm not good enough. These kind of messages are natural. And I think this voice stems from our past, uh, from what our parents said, what we learned in school. And so we know everything we see around us is real. And then if something new comes in, it's, it's um, quite often than not, you know, oh, it can't be, because I haven't seen it yet. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm hoping I'm explaining this right. Um, and, and, you know, hundreds of years ago, people believed the earth was flat. And, I mean, they believed it. They didn't even call themselves skeptics. I mean, they knew it was flat. And so when common people, when everybody has the same story, suddenly it becomes reality. And, of course, Galileo was arrested and died under house arrest because he said the earth is round, not flat. And it took Magellan going around with his ship um, to prove that the earth was round. And, and still after that was proven, it took 300 years for that earth is round to be the 
general belief on the earth. And so it's very easy for people, even myself, to challenge this is life after death real. You know, she can't have any proof. Um, but that's, that's that, uh, that inner skeptic, that inner um, critic that we all have. And when we can set that aside and start looking for um, more facts, more evidence. I am someone who studied with scientists, doctors, the physicists, a bunch of the people in the psychic realm um, of who's out there in the world right now talking about life after death and what is the proof that they have. And if we can set aside that inner skeptic and look to see the evidence with an open mind, suddenly wow, there, there is evidence that we go on. Well, let's talk about that for a moment then. Sure. What evidence did, have you been able to find that, that when we physically die here, it's not the end of our lives? Um, besides doing the medium thing myself, um, I, I went to see a woman named Reverend Rita. Uh, she's, in, again, in the medium world. This is just one, one person. And she's not only someone who can uh, say who's around you, but she draws pictures of them. And so for 30 years, uh, she's collected incredible photographs of people as they actually lived and there, and, um, and the images that she saw in her mind and um, paintings that she'd done. There is, um, we've all heard of near-death experiences, and Dr. Raymond Moody was one of the founding fathers. And back when my mind was closed to this, I said, well, certainly when we have those near-death experiences, it's just a natural part of our brain shutting down that um, we see a white light or we hear music or there's a life review. Um, the, Reverend, um, sorry, Dr. Moody has got, oh gosh, he's interviewed throughout his career. I don't want to say hundreds of thousands, but I think tens of thousands of people with the near-death experiences. And Dr. Kenneth Ring is another doctor who said, well, that's all well and good, but let me study near-death experiences of blind people. David, people that have never had sight have had, have, um, say, died in an operating table, the old floating above their body, but been able to see detailed colors, images, what people were wearing. There was one woman who had died on an operating table who had never had vision. She saw her husband in the waiting room talking to the doctor, saw what color shirt he had on, saw that the doctor dropped his pen and the husband picked up the pen and handed it back, all when she was completely out in the, in the operating room. Um, there's a, another man, Alan Botkin, who is a psychiatrist, I believe, who worked with the, vet the VA hospital. His um, career was doing was helping veterans through post-traumatic stress disorder, and there's something called EMDR, which is e eye movement desensitization. I can't remember what the R stands for, but it's a series of left-right eye movements that he would, um, whether have a pen or a beam of light, and the veterans would look left and right, and somehow reliving the experiences they had in the war and doing this procedure with them, the memory would um, no longer impact them and they wouldn't feel the intense emotion. Okay, so this is something that VA hospitals do all over the country. Well, by accident, he gave one of his clients a little too much on the left eye, left, left right, left right eye movement. And it put him in a place in his mind where this man started telling Dr. Dr. Botkin um, accurately who his deceased loved ones were. And Dr. Botkin was not somebody interested in life after death, didn't even believe in it. But it opened his mind to it. And the more he tried this with different patients, the more accurate people became, the more Dr. Botkin realized that when people believe in life after death and when people have this experience, um, it eases the pain of grief. It helps people move on in their life. And ultimately, if I can be honest, 100% honest with you and your listeners right now, I was not ever going to tell people about my life after death um, journey because it's fearful. I don't want people to think I'm a weirdo. I really don't. I don't want people to think I'm one of those people that believe in nonsense. But after my dad passed away in 2010, um, I experienced 
really severe grief for the first time. And it, as you know and your listeners know, is one of the most painful things, if not the most painful thing I think a, a person can experience in one's life. Not only the loss of my dad, but um, have you heard arguments happen when a family members die and how many um, couples get divorced if a child dies and how many siblings come apart when a parent dies and plus added to that the deep depression I was in something had me start researching the world of grief David and I wanted to know why and so ultimately if I can just touch on this because I think it's important especially here we are in September and um, grief is something that we human beings feel any time we suffer a significant loss. So if we lose a loved one to death, if we get divorced, there's a loss. If we lose a job, there's a loss. If we lose a pet, if our health declines, we get diagnosed with cancer or another illness, grief kicks in, and it's our brain having to readjust to the new reality that we're in. And I compare grieving similar to if someone is, say, addicted to a drug or um, you know, chemical dependent or alcohol, and suddenly you're not getting your fix anymore. The brain goes through a withdrawal process. And in that, we lose a whole bunch of chemicals in our brain. And so our brain isn't healthy, isn't functioning properly. And as humans, I don't know about you, but no one ever taught me about grief. We don't talk about it at school. Um, I think there's a common belief that uh, when someone dies, it's going to hurt, yes, and then, you know, we just have to get over it. And it's not so easy. And the, the gift came in why I wrote the book, David, truly, is the research that I had done about grief and how I found out about what happens to the chemicals in our brain. And so often there's so many miscommunications and arguments, and it's because our brain isn't healthy and isn't perceiving information correct. And I created an audio called How to Survive Grief just being a good Samaritan, and I got the domain name, survivegrief.com, posted online. It's still there, free. You don't have to do anything except press the play button. And long story short, in just a few months after Dad died, and I, and I put this on the Internet, over 3,000 people in 15 countries downloaded it. Emails started coming in about how it eased the pain of grief, um, how it helped people with communication within relationships, how um, they understood each other. And then the final straw was when people started reporting that they were so depressed they were going to end their own lives, and then my words caused them not to. They were able to follow the steps to get out of the pain of grief. So, yes, I know I'm doing a lot of talking here. You can jump in, David. <laughs> um, but, yes, I, I know that um, dying is mankind's biggest fear, and I, I do believe that I offer really credible evidence. I might not be able to get it all out in your interview today, but the book is 280 pages long, um, and it is credible. And then I do help people through grief, and then most importantly, how to live a powerful life, how to really be present in life, have great relationships, be in the driver's seat of your life, and playful out so that at the end of your life, there's, there's no regrets. Well, Sandra, my, my question for you now is, is this one. If we, do, if we don't die, if, we, if our lives do not end when we physically die here on Earth, then what does happen to us? I believe that, well, you, you've heard that we're all made up of energy right? Even getting into quantum physics. Obviously, all, all living creatures are, are basically, you know, electrical chemical reactions. Right. We're all energy. And if you were to go inside one of our molecules, if you're looking at your hand right now, and um, go inside one of your molecules, and there you'll find some atoms, and put a camera inside one of those atoms, it's empty. The camera wouldn't pick up anything. It's just vibrating energy. So science has proven we're all energy. And when we die, I believe our energy changes forms, the same as if a log burns, it goes first to fire and heat. Um, yes, the log is gone, but the energy remains. We can't see a lot of energy. 
that's real. So right now there's radio waves around you and me. There's um, wireless Internet. I'm sitting in my house. There's wireless Internet around. I can't see it. But I believe our energy from our human form changes to um, the energy we can't see. In fact, I don't normally say heaven. I say the hereafter because I think the reason I was able to connect with deceased loved ones and so many people are is because I think there's this invisible energy like radio waves or Internet signals vibrating that we just can't see. And if we were in this space of heaven or the hereafter, um, from what thousands of years of uh, the common denominator between what mediums have said and, and the people that have had near-death experiences and some of the oldest religions is, is this place that we go to, heaven or the hereafter, is very vivid, very real. Um, it seems that our life here on Earth was an education for our soul, if you will, because here on Earth we get to have our five senses, we get to have emotions, we get the highs, we get the lows. Unfortunately, I believe we need the lows so we can experience the highs. And whereas this place of heaven uh, is good all the time. And am I answering your question? I hope so. Yeah, I think so. But I'd like to ask you this then. If, sure. if when we die here on Earth and our energy continues to go forward, I guess, or continues to exist... My question then is, is, where was that energy before we were born? Well, that's a good question. And I personally um, have done enough research in the world of reincarnation that I adopted that. Um, not that it means that I can put off something in this life because I'm going to wait into the next. But I think um, God, I believe in God. I think there's a recycling process so that this shot isn't our only chance to, to live, to learn, to love, um, and that empowers me. Ultimately, David, I, I don't ever, ever, ever want to push my beliefs on someone else, but I want to offer enough questions, enough thoughts, enough inquiry um, for people to adopt their own beliefs and be able to live a great life now. So ultimately, do I have all the questions, the answers? Nope, I don't. Um, but I know if I can share a miraculous thing, this might help as well, um, yourself and your listeners. I had taken a course with a physicist named Russell Targ, and right now he's in his 80s, and he was one of the founding fathers of the laser beam. And he teaches a course called Remote Viewing. And what Remote Viewing, simply put, is it's an ESP technique. So is if I had something hidden in a brown paper bag over here in my house in Massachusetts, you over there in South Dakota, you could remote view and maybe not see what is in my bag, but you could get um, like little snapshots or little pictures that will come into your uh, imagination, similar to how I did that medium reading. Um, will come into your mind. And so this was a weekend course that I did, again, to kind of think, wow, that can't be true, only to prove the opposite. And one of the things I share with my readers and also on my website is how to do this remote viewing. So you could, in fact, have a magazine right in front of you, David, that you've never opened. And you take about 15 minutes to quiet your mind, you know, that little voice that will say, oh, you can't do this, this isn't real. <laughs> that girl on the radio, she's crazy. Um, but if you set that aside and just have the intention, what pictures are inside this magazine? And your mind, your creative mind, will give you flashes of images. And so it might be Abraham Lincoln or a piggy bank or a butterfly. And the homework is to have a notepad in front of you and just start writing down any flashes that come through your imagination. And what happens after about 15 minutes, when you've exhausted all those images, is you start thumbing through the magazine. And this is where I say the miracle of it all comes in, is because all of a sudden you'll see Abraham Lincoln on page 52, and that piggy bank was on page 3. And it is a feeling of how the heck was I able to do that? It escapes all logic, any skepticism, anything that might be preventing us from thinking um, that we're more than just our bodies. 
you're faced with how could I possibly just know what images were in this magazine? And to have that experience, David, opens the door a little bit to suddenly, wow, some of these other things could possibly be true. We are more than just our, our um, bodies and minds. Sandra, it's been an interesting conversation here today. If we have a listener that would like to get a copy of your book or take a look at your website, how can they go about doing that? Well, sure. Um, my book, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, is available at Amazon, um, Barnes & Noble, your favorite bookstore. And my website is wedontdie.com. And I also sell the books there if some people would like an autographed copy. And then on my website, there is a ton of free information about everything that I speak about in the book. And like I said, that free audio, How to Survive Grief, is there as well. Very good. I want to take a moment now to thank you for having spent some time visiting with us here this afternoon. We've appreciated hearing from you. My pleasure. That's Sandra Champlain joining us here this afternoon on Alive at Five. She is the author of a book entitled, We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death.